The backdrop to today's passage is, of course, what I preached on last week, the first 16 verses of Romans chapter 2. This ends with Paul referring to the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ. I have a confession to make. I am only a partial fan of the 1962 Canadian prayer book. The 1662 marriage service refers to the dreadful day of judgment when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed. But this becomes, in the name of God, from whom no secrets are hid, in the Canadian version. This reminds me of a marriage I officiated at, at Austin Parish Church. Afterwards, one of my church wardens, who was usually supportive, spoke to me. I'd mentioned death in the sermon. Most inappropriate, she thought. Even when I defended myself by pointing out that the marriage vows included the words, till death us do part, Jean was not to be convinced. What are the things that shouldn't be mentioned in sermons? At St Mary's Taunton, it's abortion. Far too controversial. Safe topics are God's love and compassion, not sin and judgment. But if we ignore sin and judgment, we're left wondering, as I did while I was growing up, why Jesus had to die. Of course, sin can always be reinterpreted for the times. In some people's minds, it becomes things such as ignorance, social injustice, poverty, personal disintegration. But I've never heard a convincing argument how Jesus' death actually addresses these issues, unless his death is somehow seen as a terrible mistake, an example of man's inhumanity to man. Friends, Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, chose to be born as one of us in that stable in Bethlehem in order that he might die, in order to pay the price of our sin, the gulf that exists between us and God because of our rebellion against him. That is the gospel. I wonder if living in an earthquake zone somehow seeps into our consciousness. We're aware that the big one might happen. Seismic upgrading is evidence of that. But it hasn't happened yet, and perhaps it won't in our lifetimes. And so we live our lives and invest mightily in property regardless. We've got such a nice Prime Minister. Admittedly, he said, but if you don't agree with him on abortion, you won't get a government grant. But this is 2018. Get with the programme. Justin has said, of course, you're more than allowed to have whatever beliefs you like, which is big of him. Just so long as you don't seek to do anything about those beliefs. He's also said, there is a difference between freedom of expression and acting on those expressions and beliefs. Let's keep religion a private affair, eh? The Roman Catholic bishops have spoken out against this. 
I await some word from the Anglican Church of Canada. Hmm. In Aldous Huxley's brave new world, they had soma, the drug to take away all pain. We have marijuana, soon to be legalized, but effectively so already. And if this doesn't do it for you, other drugs are available. I'm okay, you're okay. Accentuate the positive. Eliminate the negative. I'm not sure if I'm living through Brave New World or Orwell's 1984. The oppression feels the same. Is the reason that people are so adverse to hearing about judgment because in their heart of hearts they know they're in the wrong? But all's not right in the world. It's not a case of, I'm okay, you're okay. Surely, if you've done nothing wrong, judgment will be welcomed rather than feared. Paul is addressing such sleepwalking. Wake up, he says, get real. Stop kidding yourselves. Sin is sin. Evil is evil and prevalent and needs to be called as such and addressed, even, perhaps particularly, in enlightened Vancouver. And it will be when Jesus returns as judge. The Jews of Paul's day thought they would be all right. What did they place their trust in? First, they were Jewish. They bragged about their relationship to God. That more than gave them a head start in their eyes, that they were head and shoulders above the rest. Perhaps we struggle to get into this mindset, although there was, and indeed still is, a sect called the British Israelites, who see the British as part of the lost tribes of Israel, God's chosen people. That's a mindset that we, or perhaps I, need to repent of. Second, the Jews placed their trust in circumcision. Really. But if that's all it takes, then I'm... But we won't go there. The Talmud, which for Judaism takes precedence over the Bible, states, in the age to come, Abraham will sit at the gate of Gehenna, hell, and he will not permit a circumcised Israelite to go down there. That was what Paul was up against when trying to introduce the Jews to the need of Jesus as their saviour. How foolish on their part, we might think. How blind they were. I'll be all right. I was baptized. Church of England. I go to church regularly. Christmas and Easter. I've got a Bible on the shelf. Romans 2, verse 28. A man is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written 
code. You can take your baptism certificate with you, but don't expect it to do any good. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. One might speculate that you're better off going to a church where the Bible isn't taught faithfully. Then, perhaps, you could try pleading ignorance and see where it gets you. No one told me. I didn't realize. The Jews had no such excuse. They knew the law and knew that they had broken it. You who teach others, do you not teach yourselves? We've reached episode 14 in our journey through the 39 Articles of Religion. At what other church would you get to hear about works of supererogation? Surely that's worth a little extra in the collection plate. In Romish doctrine, ordination counts as such, going above and beyond the norm. The prayer book's ordination service contains these words, even in its Canadian form. If it shall happen, the church or any member thereof, to take any hurt or hindrance by reason of your negligence, ye know the greatness of the fault and also the horrible punishment that will ensue. The horrible punishment isn't referring to something a bishop or a chancellor of a diocese might exact, but rather to the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ. These are words I take seriously. They are in line with James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, because you know but we who teach will be judged more strictly. I have been encouraged, to put it mildly, to water down what I say, and maybe life would be quieter if I did. But those ordination words, from James 3.1, keep ringing in my ears and prevent me from doing so. The motto of St. John's College, Nottingham, with which I had some connection in my last pastorate, is, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.16 Far from getting a place in the fast lane, those who are ordained can expect to be judged more harshly as those who ought to know better. If that is the case for those who are ordained, how does the idea creep in that those who are Christian will somehow bypass judgment? We will not. That is what Paul is getting at. We will all be judged, without exception. It's not being Jewish that counts, not being circumcised physically, not what we do outwardly as Christians, but what Paul refers to in his parlance as circumcision of the heart, what we actually believe, the secrets of our hearts. Psalm 146, verse 3. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. Don't put your trust in Justin Trudeau. He will one day face a judgment greater than that of the electorate. Don't even place your trust in the rector, for he 
is mortal as you are. Place your hand into the hand of God who reaches out to you in the form of Jesus. There is only one sure way we can face God's judgment, as we must, with Jesus as our personal Lord and Saviour. He who was born for us and died for us. Do you put your trust in him? Will you put your trust in him today? So I went forth, and finding the hand of God, trod gladly into the night. Amen.